I'm Bill Kelly. Fasten your seatbelt, prepare for takeoff. We're about to soar like an eagle with the flying fishermen of Daniels Harbor. Stedman Brophy's got to be the most unlikely pilot since Snoopy took on the Red Baron. He's a regular guy, a family man, the last person you'd expect to find with his head in the clouds. Stedman wasn't even in a plane, let alone fly one, until he was nearly 40 years old. But today, he's as comfortable in his single-engine float plane as he is on the water. The only thing anyone really taught me how to do was fly airplanes. He told me it's the third or fourth time he went up with me that I must have been born in an airplane. For Stedman, it's all in a day's work. If he wasn't up here, flying supplies to his big game hunting camps, you'd probably find him out in boats, getting ready for the inshore fishing season. There's not a way you can throw it in no out. That lint will stay in there just like we chucks it overboard, no? And if he wasn't in the fishing boat, you'd likely find him here in the barn, looking after his cows. Animals, he says, are much smarter than most people believe. I think they got a lot more sense than what we give them credit for, and I think everybody would think that about them if they spent the time around where they was at. They can almost ask you when they want something to eat or something to drink or tell you when they want to be milked. Stedman Brophy is a jack of all trades. Of course you have to be if you expect to carve out a living in a place like the Great Northern Peninsula. Never since I can mind that you could make a living on this coast working in the woods only, farming only, or fishing only. You had to depend on one or two or two or two different things, because if you're an inshore fisherman, it's only, at, well, you're only talking about May, June, July, and August, and then the weather gets too bad to do anything. Finding something to do is certainly not a problem for Brophy, not anymore. But for Stedman, it's still full speed ahead. Today, it's a new service station. Tomorrow, no doubt, it'll be something else. We're hoping to be ready to open now in a, in another week, we're hoping, we're hoping, uh, hoping the uh, 1st of July, just around the 1st of July, so we were trying to get it done. They were supposed to come down now and supposed to be down yesterday or today to clean up the tanks, get them going, so we're about ready to go and just filling in a bit of time out of there and trying to landscape it a bit. Stedman's at an age now when most people tend to ease up a bit, but Brophy's a driven man, so it's not for the reason you might ordinarily expect. If I don't make a lot of money, it don't make no difference to me. I never did make a lot of money because I always worked hard for it, and you can't make a lot of money working hard. you got to get into something, I guess, where you can make money fast. But I don't worry about that. I just hammer away at it. No, Stedman's obsession is not the almighty dollar. To him, money isn't everything, but family is, and so is the intrinsic value in work itself. Busy all the time, but uh, see, I wouldn't be out of it for four boys and a couple of girls we got here. I don't want that much more at my age, but uh, I'm hoping that they're going to take it over. I'm 55 year old a couple of days ago, so I just about give up providing for myself. When I started it, I had a family coming in, and uh, our youngest now is going in 16. So some of them, are not, one fellow been working with me now for seven or eight years. I've got an old four-time license, and the girls, the two of the girls have been working with us for a couple of years. And uh, I guess it's all on account of them. If I'd been only myself, or if I'd had one kid, I'd have probably put him through college and, uh, and let him go out and look for a job. But it don't look very easy to me now for young people to find jobs, and I don't want to see them uh, not know how to do nothing. If they go to college and, and take a trade, that's the only thing they know how to do. Right now, I got the boys I got, they're able to work in the woods, they're able to fish, they're able to farm. Well, that's trade things that they can do that, that they don't have to worry about to eat. To receive Lord true The Brophy Clan. Seven good reasons why Stedman keeps going. Not only to feed them, but as he says, to make sure they learn how to feed themselves. Still, he could never do it alone. But Stedman's got a partner. Well, my wife, she was a cow girl. I picked her up in cow or got in tango with her, I guess. And uh, heffy, heffy pain she was. I married her, I was 26 when I was married, and she was, uh, she was 20. She's a good woman. She treated me good, and my mother used to always tell me that I'd never get a woman 
that would do for me what she done, but uh, she'll do so much for me as my mother would. For a man born and raised in Daniels Harbor, Stedman got into the fishery relatively late in life. He was in his mid-twenties. Up until then, he had spent most of his time in the woods, working in his father's sawmill. First cod trap ever I saw, the bottom one out showed me how to sit. He you know it a bit, and then I went on from that. I, uh, see, me and my father didn't fish. Daddy fished when he was a young man, but after I grew up, he didn't do any fishing. So I never had a chance to learn too much from him. The most of what I got, I picked it up on my own. I never worked at anything as hard in my life as I did cod fishing with a cod trap. It's hard work. It's just as hard on most if you're not getting no fish as if you're getting a load every day. You still got to tuck it and handle it and keep it in shape. Well, actually, it's, it's easier if you're getting fish, isn't it? Well, you, you don't know what to work the same, eh? Well, you're in better spirits. You got right, that's what I say. You don't know what to work. Two of Stedman's sons are with him today. Young Byron is only part-time. He's still in school. But Stedman's oldest boy, Leander, himself a married man, is at it for a living. Leander, one of the first times he ever went out with me, when he was a little boy, he was quite before he could do anything. First thing I'd do was take him aboard and tie it on. And away we'd go. I used to fish alone then. He went out one time with me and my boy laid down. And I never caught on what was going on. My boy started to cry. I said, what's wrong? He said he had a bad stomach. She's sick, see? The fishery has been poor up this way lately, but Stedman and Leander have gone ahead and bought a new boat anyway. Sooner or later, Stedman says, it's got to get better. There was a few years ago and I when fishing was good, I grossed, had a shareman with me and grossed up to $22,000 fishing. That was about my best year, but when I would be up around 10, 12, 15,000. We got a long ways to go this year to get to that. Now I can see the fishing changing, but uh, perhaps not in my time. I can mind when there was bad fisheries. I wasn't fishing, but I can mind about it. Everything got its good years and its bad years. Leander, you're planning to make the fishery a full-time job, are you? Planning to, yeah. yeah. Are you uh, pretty discouraged these days with yeah, lack of fish? Yeah, yeah. But you're, you're confident, are you, that it'll get better? Sometime, I guess. Just stick with long enough. Well, now, you've been in the fishing boat all your life, haven't you? Yeah, I've had a license for seven years, eight years. Uh -huh. Now, you also work at the farm, but the farming is not for you, eh? No. You like not, yeah, anyway, it might be if the fishing gets any worse. <laughs> but you're, 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 you think it'll come back? Yeah, I think it will. If it goes bad enough, of course, most everyone will have to give it up. And then it'll come back. If the fishery does stay bad for a while, the Brophies will be better off than most. Stedman and his ready-made workforce have an ideal fallback, a 145-acre dairy farm just behind Daniels Harbor. The Brophies have about 50 cows, and unlike the fishery, they're steady producers, something you can always count on. The key to a dairy farm, of course, is keeping your expenses down. And Stedman and the family spend a good bit of their time in the summer clearing land and increasing their production of hay and grains. The more they can make themselves, the less they'll have to bring in from the mainland. Well, how is she going? Well, she said you could probably spread some lime or something, but it's too uh, soft to... Too soft to seed. Too soft to seed, So yeah. we'll pick up a few rocks or sticks or something, I guess, and wait okay. for it to dry. Okay. Clearing land around here is not just man's work. All hands do their part. This piece, we're getting it ready for seeding, which uh, we would, it would be ready this evening if, uh, if the weather were a little bit warmer. Very little work and it's ready to seed. Right now, for the past couple of three weeks, they've been three of them out just about four times. Eh? Picking up rocks and leveling land and liming land and seeding, and we've seeded down about 12 acres. 
of oats and uh, so much hay. We were saving about 16, 17 acres all together. Now that rig out that Les is on there, that's an interesting machine. Yeah, that's a bulk lime spreader. We got that, uh, it was made in Pennsylvania. We picked it up about in Nova Scotia. It's only about uh, five minutes to spread about five tonne of lime, besides loading it. Now, once you get it bored, you can spread a, a, an awful pile of lime in ten, in ten hours, but you would have it continuous. Well, Geraldine, uh, she's, she's not a girl that likes to work in the barn too much. She, uh, she don't mind housework, and she don't mind working at this, driving a piece of machinery, so I guess we'll let her stick to that. Byron and, uh, and the other girl there, they, there was a lot of milking and less, there was a lot of milking. He was watching Nell there now, driving the tractor, towing a, a disc arrow, trying to level it, but uh, we see we can't do much with it. It's a bit too wet, but uh, if, you, if you disc it when it's drying, you help to dry it. You, it gets the water out of it, mixes it up, and it'll dry quicker, so he's young, he's 15 years old, but uh, we got to watch him close because machinery is not play toys. Well, I consider they're all pretty good, and uh, I'm trying to just learn them what I know. I, uh, I don't know a lot about any one thing, but I know a nice little bit, bit about a lot of things. And uh, I don't spend any time doing anything but, uh, but trying to teach the youngster something to play when I'm asleep. So I suppose the idea here now uh, is to become self-sufficient eventually in hay production, is that it? That's what uh, we and every other farmer should do if we want to make money. Self-sufficient and good hay, which means we don't have to buy as much grain either. Grain right now has gone sky high in price. We're, uh, I'd say it'll be another five years before we can be self-sufficient. Last year now, we mowed a thousand bales of hay last year. And this year we're, uh, we're going to make Hopefully, about 15, between 1,500 and 2,000 bales, a, eh? And we're going to have 20 acres of oats and barley for silage. Now, this is, uh, this is the best field that we got so far to cut this year. Uh, this will be ready to cut in another week. It's, it's not, real, uh, not real tall, but it's fairly tall, and it's real thick. Real thick, there'll be a lot of a lot of feed on it. That's a uh, 70% timothy and 15% of one type clover and 15 of another. Which is uh, they say you can't beat that for Newfoundland, timothy and clover. You can't imagine what this have done in a week. And then in the next week, if you're not ready to mow it, it'll be falling out. Stedman Brophy's always trying something new. A few years ago, when these pictures were taken, he had just started processing his own milk. A few more jobs for the family, he figured, but he couldn't sell enough to make it pay. The venture failed. You meet people and they say, well, your milk is awful good, your milk is real good, and we like it real good, and then you go in the rest of the days after the and you see other milk on the table. So uh, there was something wrong somewhere. Stedman soon found another market for his milk by trucking it raw into Deer Lake. But today, two years later, the processing plant is still empty. It hurts me. It nearly breaks me heart to come in here and, uh, and see it. I have to force the clothes down and have to put in so much time in it, and the young people put so much time in it. It was driving us so far in the hole that we just had to give it up because we couldn't get a market for the milk. We're going to hold on to the building anyhow, and perhaps we'll decide to do something else with the building and the equipment. I can hardly answer you. I don't just know what's going on to it. Don't worry about Stedman. He'll think of something. He always does. Time for a break now. When we come back, Stedman Brophy turns to big game outfitting. Welcome back. It's early October now, at the height of the big game hunting season on the southwest coast. Today, Stedman Brophy is on his way to one of four hunting camps he operates in the Gray River Bergio Lapoil area. Brophy built the camps in the 70s, and it was at that time he also got into flying. I figured there'd be something else I would accomplish, and I did it. 
I've never done anything that I like any better than flying. It's a holiday for me to go flying a plane for two months in the fall of the year and working real hard and on moose beat. It's a holiday. Was it something you always wanted to do? No, never knew what it was. If I had, I'd have probably been doing it for a living. I didn't know anything about airplanes till I was uh, in my thirties. When I started outfitting business, a couple of years before I started outfitting business was the first time I ever went in an airplane. The hunting season only lasts a month or so, but for the brophies, it's a lucrative sideline. American hunters gladly shell out $2,500 for a crack at the likes of that, and Stedman handles 40 to 50 of them each fall. The business also creates work for about a dozen local fishermen who act as Stedman's guides. We've made money at it, and, and well, we've turned it over and made it for someone else, and made a bit for ourselves. That's the way it goes, I guess. We paid out uh, just around $25,000 last year in wages two fellas that, that wanted to go to work and make a bit of money, so that was some good besides my own crowd. Stedman says the key to success in the outfitting business is good service. Happy hunters come back. If the weather is here a bit reasonable, all I see is all of my camps just about every day. If anyone gets sick, the, it's not going to be over 24 hours. If the weather is good now to get there, right? And Stedman takes care of the little things, too. Today, he's flying moose meat back to the camp, saving the hunters a tough slog through the woods. The youngster is the guide's son. His wife is here too. She's the cook. Oh, you can't go there. It's a quick turnaround for Stedman. Another hunter is out there waiting on his shuttle service. John's taking a bit of a spell after a hard day in the woods, I guess? Yeah, we had quite a hike this morning. How's the hunt been going? Real good, real good. I filled out with a, a moose and a caribou. What, in just a couple of days here? Yeah, uh, I got in here Saturday, Saturday evening, late Saturday afternoon, I got a bull moose. And uh, yesterday was Monday, I got a caribou, shot a caribou. The outfitter's been real good to us. He showed us game, he treated us real good with food and his, com his accommodations. And Everything's going real well. We're well satisfied with it. Stedman's back with John's hunting partner. Both guys are from northern Pennsylvania. They decided to take a chance on Newfoundland after spotting an ad Stedman placed in an American hunting magazine. Yeah, I've already killed that now. We'll be able to Two hours walk, I guess, from here with a third, so we already had lunch for the pond, it's only a little over half hours walk, so that's the idea of picking it up out there. Save a lot of work for them. So this is another caribou stepping, is it? No, it's moose. Yep. Yeah. Moose with no bones. <coughs> like I said, if you bone them out, you got up around 200, depending on size of the animal, eh? so anywhere from 180 now to 250. So this is uh, your other hunter here now. This is, uh, yeah, I forget his name, sir. Huh? Paul Gustin. Paul Gustin. Nice to meet you. How'd you enjoy it today? Well, it's fantastic. Yeah? Yeah. yeah well, I don't know about today. Today's a lugging day, right? <laughs> a tough slug. Yeah, well, we, uh, we had a great time. Yeah. Good hunt. Good Got people. You. So how would you compare this with the other hunts you've had? Oh, it's the best. I've been in Colorado, Quebec, Pennsylvania. That's where we're from. We hunt. So what makes this one the best? No, we got a moose and a caribou. I guess that didn't hurt anything, right? <laughs> no, it's just the people in the country. I think it's beautiful. No question, I'll be back. You will? My two brothers and father, I think I'll bring. <laughs> this is the first time you hunted uh, moose? No, I hunted five weeks in Quebec. Oh, I see. I saw two moose. Not true. On Monday, we saw 11 moose. <laughs> oh, that's a big difference, right? <laughs> yeah, number 11 was the bull I shot. Now, if you know any hunters, you certainly don't have to be told they like nothing better than comparing their racks and claiming victory. But these two guys will have to hold in their chest for another while at least. A third man is still to report in. My golly! So you got your caribou today? Uh, moose today. Moose today, caribou yesterday. Oh, very good. So did you take him down with a bow? Nope, couldn't get within range. Okay. And then he was on the run when I shot him. 
I see. Ready to take chance with the first hunt, huh? That's right. Next year, bow and arrow only. <laughs> Coming back next year, right? Eh? Absolutely. <sighs> They've had a good hunt. Absolutely. First time up here. A great hunt. You do quite a bit of hunting, I take it? I enjoy hunting. Uh -huh. Where do you do most of your hunting? I travel. Uh, I was in Quebec a couple of years ago for bear. I was successful there. I went there for moose, but the moose herd is not like it is here. And that's why I came to Newfoundland. Hard slogging in the woods, I guess? I'm telling you something. I thought I was in shape. <laughs> but walking out there, I tell you, it's, it's a new experience. It's rough, but it's enjoyable, and I love it. There being the one laugh, and I only had to log one trip of me. <laughs> There's a nice bit of expense to keep the camps up. They're not uh, anything like motels, as you can see, but they're, they're pretty good. A fellow can do without a shower for a week. We get no complaints from the hunters. We, we don't want to get any bigger. It's only just a family business. The hunters can relax now. The grub will soon be ready. But Stedman's off again. He's got three more camps to hit before nightfall. Daniel's harbor in the dead of winter. The whole place is in hibernation. She's locked up solid. The fishery is a good three months away and there's no good reason to fly an airplane either. But remember Stedman's service station? It's up and running, and so is Mrs. Brophy. The kids are in the barn, and Stedman's out of town, on business, of course. He's continually on the go. Whatever he can make a dollar, he's at. Try to keep us on the move, going, helping the family all we can. He's been on the road now a lot far, trucking A and that. I haven't have stopped since I've come out of deals. Two or three times a week. Today, Stedman is on his way back from Nova Scotia with three new cows and a full load of hay. We can't buy cows in Newfoundland anywhere that I know for. I don't know anywhere where we could go to buy a dairy cow in Newfoundland. And hay, there is a fair amount of hay to buy in Newfoundland. We're buying practically all of our hay in Newfoundland. But the cows had to come down, so we chucked on a load of hay to come with them. There's no time in the year that I don't find something to do. Winter time is uh, just so busy in one way as it is in the summer. And if we need a load of hay, I go and gnaws it. And if we need to go to look for a cow, I go and do it. Just filling in and, uh, and waiting for spring to come to get in the boat again for a while. I've always had plenty to eat and always had a job. I always have me out of strength, so I guess there's something to be thankful over. <laughs>